What a splendid speech. <clears throat> I enjoyed that thoroughly. It is a true joy to be before you this morning. I have appreciated every opportunity that I've had across the years in coming to the great lectureship here at Brown Trail. I'm impressed deeply with the one that we're currently in. I do not believe that a finer or more timely or a more needed topic could have been chosen than the one that we've been dealing with. And of course, with the great lessons that we've listened to, the book that will continue to set forward these lessons, the tapes that will go far and wide, no telling how much good can be accomplished by a lectureship like this. I appreciate this great and good congregation, the fine school of preaching. I'm glad to recommend it, and every one of us needs to help the school here financially, morally, and speaking a good word in its behalf whenever we can. We can be ambassadors of goodwill for the good congregation and its fine school of preaching here. I was just thinking as we were singing that marvelous hymn a few moments ago that if David's life had been built entirely upon that wonderful concept of walking in the light of God's Word, I would be speaking on a different topic this morning. The sordid affair with Bathsheba, the bathing beauty, would have never occurred in Jerusalem some 1,100 years before the birth of Christ, or about 1,000 years before it, or roughly 3,000 years ago. But nevertheless, that account did occur, and my assigned task this morning is to lift some lessons from David and Bathsheba. They are the two participants in this crime of passion, and I call it a crime because it was against the law of God, and its participation by men and women today is still a crime against high and holy heaven. Inspiration traces the course of David's life from the time that he was a shepherd lad in the Bethlehem area until he became the dying monarch about ready to go the way of all of the earth. He had an illustrious heritage. A lovely legacy was his. He was the son or descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the three founding fathers of the Hebrew and Israelite people. He was the great-grandson of Boaz and Ruth. His grandfather was Obed. His father was Jesse. I don't believe that the Bible reveals the mother's name, but at least twice in the book of Psalms, and maybe more than that, he referred to his mother as being the Lord's handmaiden, and that says quite a little bit about his mother. David was a beautiful young lad in spirit and disposition, no doubt being very handsome as far as physical appearance was concerned. He grew up as a lad of industry. He was not idle as a boy. He was faithful in his task of being a the shepherd of his father's sheep in the Bethlehem area. He is remembered in early youth as the one who gladly did something that Saul was unwilling to do, that Jonathan was unwilling to do, that his older bragging brothers were not willing to do, that is, march out on a southern battlefield in Palestine and meet Goliath one who had uh, confronted the army of the living God and challenged Israel to present a man on the battlefield for a two-man battle. David, with five stones and a slingshot, and he had four of them left over when the conflict ended, went out and won one of the great victories in Israelite history. He became an instant success, an instant hero in the eyes of his fellow Israelite people. It's always seemed amazing to me with all of the praise and all of the many honors heaped upon him in early youth that he kept his feet on the ground, that he remained modest, that he remained humble, and he kept his cool, so to speak, the years in which he was hunted down by Saul's rage, Saul's envy, Saul's uh, constant jealousy, even returning good for evil in the case of Saul. Ultimately, when he was about 30 years of age, he ascended the throne of the Israelite people, and for the next 40 years, he was the second king of the United Kingdom. Perhaps for about 20 of these years, he maintained his unblemished character. 
walking wisely and gaining almost daily esteem and popularity among his own people as well as among his contemporaries and surrounding nations at all. And yet there came that day whenever his army had gone forth and he stayed back in Jerusalem that he looked upon a woman bathing herself. Lust developed in his heart. He sent for the woman. Adultery was the raped product of that lust. And a little bit later she sent word to the king, I am with child. It couldn't be passed off to the woman's husband. He was away fighting a battle for David and for his kingdom. David now became very desperate and had to do something he realized. And that led into his walking down deception lane and ultimately walking down murder avenue. I'm confident that every one of us who has read this account whenever we finished it in 2 Samuel 11 and 12, has wished to ourselves, would God this incident had never occurred, but it did occur. The second person in this tragic and sordid affair is Bathsheba. She is also called Bathsheba. She was the daughter of an amiable, as he is mentioned in the Bible, or Elam, she was the granddaughter of Ahithophel. And I've often thought since I learned that, that perhaps this led partly, if not wholly, to the future antagonism between Ahithophel and David. You'll remember in David's later life when Absalom, the son of rebellion, turned against his father and tried to take the crown and the kingdom away from David, that Ahithophel did not remain true and loyal to David, though the two of them had been the very closest and warmest of friends in earlier days. Ahithophel sided with Absalom and even suggested counsel upon one occasion, let me go forth and I'll kill the king and bring his crown to you. It just may well have been the case that what David did to his granddaughter Bathsheba may have paved the way for this later hatred and conflict between Ahithophel and David. Bathsheba, as she is mentioned to us in the early verses of Second Samuel 11, is a married woman. Her husband is Uriah the Hittite, and everything that is suggested in the Bible in regard to Uriah sets him forth as a man of loyalty, a man of integrity, a man who wanted to do the right thing, and yet a man whose commander-in-chief at home had betrayed him and had sought to steal the affections of his own wife. I wondered in reading the account whether Uriah ever did know the sordid affair that went on between his wife back home and his king on the throne. Nevertheless, Uriah is remembered with a great deal of honor and respect by every one of us. I never have believed that Bathsheba was the innocent one in this. It takes two to participate in a crime like this, unless it be a case of rape or force on the part of one toward the other. There seemingly is no reluctance upon her part when the king sends for her, and later on when her husband has died and the king decides to make her another one of his many wives. But with that as somewhat of background material laid, I want to set forth some lessons that we should learn from this unhappy and sordid incident. About 20 are listed in the book, and I'll cover a few of them, as many as time will allow this morning. First of all, we see that in this sin, and this is true with practically every sin, there is a background that produces it. There was a background that produced the sin of Adam and Eve and the excellences of Eden. There was a background that produced the sins of Cain in Genesis 4. And there is a background that produced this sin. David, at the time that his army went forth, perhaps in the spring or the fall of the year, because these were usually the two seasons in which they did most of their fighting, summer being too hot, winter being too cold, though there were exceptions to this. But nevertheless, it was at a time when his army went to the east to fight against the Ammonites. David sent his army. He did not go before them. 
David perhaps is 50 years old at the time that this incident occurred. He remained behind in Jerusalem. And at even time, as he walked upon the roof of the palace, he looked and saw a beautiful woman bathing herself. Is a public place the right place to engage in bathing? Well, evidently not. Surely Bathsheba could have found another place to have taken a bath rather than in a place where the king's eye might see her. Nevertheless, she chose not to do so. When the king looked upon the woman, and no man is safe looking upon a woman that is immodestly clad or has nothing upon. I remember some years ago writing a series of articles for perhaps the Gospel Advocate or some other, and a fellow from up in New Jersey began to correspond with me. He didn't like what I said about immodesty. He didn't like what I said about dancing in the articles. He said, I have danced practically all my adult life, and I can go to the bathing beaches here on the East Coast and look upon the women in their bikinis, and it doesn't bother me. Well, I just don't believe a normal man can do that. Maybe he wasn't normal. Maybe, <laughs> maybe he has a short memory or had a short memory. Maybe he just wasn't telling the truth about the matter. But I don't believe any normal man can be in position like that and can keep his thoughts pure as they ought to be. I think I know enough about the male part of the race to be in position to say that. Well, nevertheless, David sent for the woman, and uh, adultery was the end result of their union that day. There was a background to this sin, just as there is a background to every sin. John tells us in 1 John 2, 15 through 17 about the lust, and that means the desires of the flesh and of the eye and of the pride of the vain glory of life. Many sins are committed today that were planned for last night or last week. Micah, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, spoke about men who would plan their sins during the night and the next day they would execute them because it was in their power to do so. A second lesson that we see, sin is progressive. It was in the case of Adam and Eve. It was in the case of Abel. It was in the incest case of Reuben and Bella, one of the secondary wives of Jacob. And certainly sin is progressive in this case. It began with a moment of idleness, and Satan always has a heyday with an idle mind. Perhaps no man or no woman is more vulnerable toward sin than when spending a great deal of time in idleness. Then there came the look of lust, and David did not do as other people did in Bible times, fleeing the scene. He fled toward the scene and toward the realization of the union with a woman. And so there is a progression of sin, the idleness, the look of lust, the sending for her, the committed adultery, and later on attempts to cover the crime, walking the route of deception, and ultimately murder itself. Sin is truly progressive. The opening verses of the book of Psalms talk about the progressive nature of sin. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. More than one commentator has talked has, has talk about the progression of sin as set forth. That is the walking, the standing, and then the sitting down. There is an increase in one sinful life set forth in that verse. There is a third lesson that is set forth in the case of David and Bathsheba, and that is the lesson that David was not willing to seek out uh, the avenue of escape. In, in a later part of the Bible, the Apostle Paul would write, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, that there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow us to be tempted above that we are able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape. But David really was not interested in seeking out that way of escape. 
He was not an unmarried man. He had a number of wives in the palace, any one of which could have satisfied the aroused passions of the hour. But David was not interested in finding a way of escape. He did not do as Joseph, an earlier Israelite, did when he faced the same kind of thing from Potiphar's wife, Genesis 39. The Bible tells us that at one point in Potiphar's wife's uh, intention to snare Joseph into an immortal escapade, that when she caught hold of his coat, he left it and fled the scene. He thought more of his character than he did of his coat or his garment. There was an international beauty a number of years ago that was interviewed. I think she had just won the title of either Miss World or Miss Universe. But in the interview, she suggested, I would no more entertain the idea of marrying a man that I had not been intimate with than I would in buying a frock coat that I had not tried on. Tried on. Well, there's a great deal of difference between trying on a coat before purchase and trying out marriage before one enters into it. I've often suggested in contrasting how that woman felt and how Joseph reacted, she thought more of a coat than she did her character. Joseph thought more of his character than he did his coat. But David did not flee the scene. He did not do, as Paul was to suggest to the Corinthian brethren and later generations, flee fornication, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. There is another lesson that we see in this incident, and that is the lesson that adultery is a crimson crime. In fact, I believe that it is the greatest crime that can be committed against the matrimonial institution. It's the one thing that our Lord stressed in Matthew 19, 9 that will permit the innocent to put away the guilty and enter into a marriage with another acceptable or eligible person. I think that says something about the enormity of the sin of adultery or fornication. Perhaps David and Bathsheba neither one realized just how far-reaching the results would be of their sin. I, for a moment, do not uh, think that David, in that moment of passion, thought, now just a few weeks from now, I will become a person of deception. I will become a person desperate. I will become a person who will even uh, think in terms of murdering this woman's husband. Little did David realize how very, very enormous the sin of adultery was. And many people apparently today do not realize what a capital crime they commit when they engage in fornication or in adultery. There is another lesson that we see from the story of David and Bathsheba, and that is the lesson that in this account, sin does something in our relationship with other people as well as our relationship to God Almighty. When Nathan confronted David about the enormity of his sin, he suggested that David had despised the Lord and his commandment, that he had caused other people to think less of the God of heaven and his cause upon the earth. David and Bathsheba not only sinned against each other, but they sinned against their families. David sinned against the people that he had been shepherd king over for about 20 years at this time. But even with all of those other lives that were touched with the enormity of their sin, David is led to say in Psalm 51, apparently a psalm that he penned after Nathan had gone and confronted him with his sin, that my sin is ever before me, against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this great evil in thy sight. David recognized a little bit later on the enormity of his sin toward God. He was not suggesting that no other person was touched by that sin, but sin is so much against God that he could say, Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this great evil in thy sight. Another thing that we see in the sordid story of David and Bathsheba is that there is a right way to cover sin, there is a wrong way to cover sin. 
David tried to cover his sin in, improperly at first. He tried to pass off the paternity case to Uriah. When Bathsheba sent word that she was with child, she knew who the father was, so did David. And they both knew that Uriah was not the father. He was not home at the time conception occurred. He was away helping David's army, risking life and limb to help his king, no doubt with great deal, a great deal of love and respect for his commander-in-chief back home. David immediately sent for Uriah. Let him have a furlough, he must have told uh, Joab, his general on the fighting front. And David had already conceived in mind, now when Uriah comes, he'll go home. He and his wife will have the husband and wife relationship, and the paternity of the child will then be Uriah's. No one will ever be the riser except Bathsheba and me. But this didn't work because Uriah refused to go down. And David wondered why. And Uriah said, I'm not about to go down and enjoy the comforts of my home and my wife's love while my comrades are risking life and limb on the fighting front. This I shall not do. Then David added another sin. He got the man drunk. And of course, the Bible has something to say about putting a bottle to one's lips of a neighbor in order to uh, have wrong engaged in. David got him drunk, thinking he'd surely go home in a drunken condition, and still the paternity of the child could be passed on to Uriah. But again, Uriah did not go home. And so another desperation tactic has to be sought out. David, in somewhat of a cold and cruel and calloused way, so unlike the man that we have learned to love in tracing his course of life for his first 50 years or approximately that, he wrote out the death sentence for this man and put it into the man's hand. And the man took the letter of condemnation. The man took his own condemnation his own murder, rather, to the fighting general, Joab. And the uh, request was, you put Uriah in the place where only the valiant are to be found, where he's sure to fall in battle, and then have the other man uh, uh, quickly draw away from him and let the fire of the enemy fall upon him. And that was done. Joab had word sent by calm, Uriah is dead. After a period of mourning, and I wondered whether this was really and truly genuine on Bathsheba's part, but nevertheless, when the period of public mourning was over, David sent for her, she became his wife, and then chapter 11 ends with the observation, but the thing which David had done displeased the Lord. Quite literally in the Hebrew, it was evil in the sight of the Lord. That was an improper way to cover his sin. Later on, when Nathan went in and confronted the king with a well-known parable about the man and his little ewe lamb, and finally said to the king, Thou art the man, and David realized the enormity of his guilt, he simply confessed, I have sinned against the Lord. David would later write in Psalm 32, Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now he had chosen out a proper way. That is just simply a confession of his wrong. Another lesson that we see in this account, and that is that the tragic course of future consequences would never leave his threshold. In fact, Nathan said, The sword shall never depart from thy house, from thy family. And, of course, it didn't. I think we all need to be impressed with the fact that we can be forgiven of a sin, but that doesn't remove the consequences that have to be faced. I remember a number of years ago visiting a man in the hospital who, as I now recall, had been involved in uh, a drunken accident in which he had lost one or two of his limbs and was just barely hanging on to life. Well, there's no doubt about the fact that that man can be forgiven for getting drunk and then being involved in a tragic automobile accident, but that won't restore the amputated arm, the amputated leg, as a result of his accident. Some people face the consequences almost immediately. 
Others face the consequences somewhere down the line. But the consequences come even after the guilt has been removed. Nathan told him, The Lord hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Remember, adultery under the Mosaic economy carried with it capital punishment, even as a number of other sins against the Mosaic economy did. It was a capital offense. David could have been put to death. Bathsheba could have been put to death. And the Lord through Nathan said, The Lord hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. And yet Nathan pointed out the consequences are going to stay there. Whenever Nathan came to him and told him about the man with the little ewe lamb, who, when he had a guest in his home, the rich man, instead of going out and getting one of his own animals, he went over and took this man's only ewe lamb. And of course, we know the application of that. The rich man is David. The many uh, animals that he would have had would refer to his own wives. The poor man would be Uriah, the little ewe lamb, representative of Bathsheba, the only wife that he had. And finally, David sees himself in the portrait. But not before, he says, the man that does that is worthy to die. He shall pay fourfold of what he has stolen. Well, David really paid fourfold as far as sons were concerned. The little boy that was conceived in the illicit union died a few days after birth. And then a little bit later on, Amnon, one of his sons, committed rape upon Tamar, a daughter. And a couple of years later, Absalom put that son to death. That's child number two that David lost. And then a little bit later on, Absalom is put to death. That's three sons that are taken rather tragically. And then after David's death, Adonijah, who wanted to take over the throne and had even planned to do so, was put to death by Solomon. How little did David realize about that fourfold that it would take that from among his own sons? But there is another lesson that we see in this, and that is that sin is really never isolated. It's pretty hard for a person to commit just one sin. It's pretty hard for a person just to tell one lie or to commit one act because usually the first one uh, brings about a second or a third. Sin is much more likely to travel in duets or trios or multiples, and here it did in multiples, than it is remaining isolated. There is another story or lesson that we learn from this account of David and Bathsheba, and that is that sin has a way of hardening a person's heart, of uh, searing his conscience, of callousing his spirit. It did so in David's case. We don't see the remorse. We don't see the regret. We don't see the penitence the next day or even the day the act occurred. In fact, the day stretch into weeks and the weeks into months. And then the awfulness of his sin, the enormity of his transgression is brought home by Nathan. David, when he was trying to pass off the child's paternity, to Uriah was in a hardened condition. His spirit and his conscience were seared over. And certainly that's true when he writes out the man's own murder edict and sends it by the innocent Uriah to be taken to General Joab. Sin has a way of hardening people. I have talked to people who would tell me, now when I first began to take the name of the Lord in vain, it hurt. But after I had taken the name of the Lord in vain for months or years, it doesn't bother me anymore to use profanity. People are much more apt to be bothered with the first act of immorality than the tenth or the hundredth case of such. I've talked to people who at one time were faithful in church attendance and now seldom ever darken the church building door. And more than one has told me that when I first began to miss, maybe occasionally on Wednesday night and then Sunday night and then maybe Sunday morning Bible study and finally the worship hour on Sunday, the first few times really bothered me. Now I can miss without any uh, pain or any pain at all. Sin has a way of hardening people. Brother J.W. J. W. McGarvey in his great book of sermons tells the story of meeting a lady in Kentucky as the two of them were traveling. 
And uh, he talked to her about becoming a Christian. And she said, Brother McGarvey, 30 years ago, I went to church one morning with my mind made up I was going to become a Christian. Something happened. I chose not to do so. And even though I've gone quite regularly since then, I've never had the least desire to obey the gospel sins. Sin has a way of hardening people. The writer of Hebrews makes mention of the hardened heart that is created by sin. Sin hardens the heart. It makes insensitive the better feelings of the human personality. There is another lesson that we learn from David and Bathsheba, and that is the lesson that the way of the transgressor is hard. Solomon, his son, would later write that into the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, 15. But David and Bathsheba learned it in quite a personal way. Many people feel like that there is a great kick in sin, and I'd be the last one to suggest or deny that there is some, uh, some kind of pleasure in sin. The Bible talks about the pleasure of sin in Hebrews 11:25, but it's quick to say it's seasonal in nature. It's not long-lasting as far as any human heart is concerned. Night's Treasury of Illustrations contains an account of a young man who said, I'm getting a kick out of my sins. Later on, somebody asked, are you still getting a kick out of your sins? And now he responded, oh no, now I'm getting the kick back from my sins. Sin has a way of kicking back. Solomon knew it and wrote about it in Proverbs 13, 15. David knew about it. He realized that if he had not learned that lesson very closely in earlier years, he learned it in the aftermath of his sordid affair with Bathsheba. Never again would David's name be as it once had been. The way of the transgressor is hard. There is another lesson, and that is the tarnished reputation. The unblemished name never soars quite as high again. David had one of the greatest names of anybody who had ever lived. Certainly nobody his contemporary had a greater name. I became interested some years ago and checked this out either in Strong's or Young's Analytical Concordance. But other than the names of deity, David's name occurs more often in the Bible than any other man, any other woman. I think that says something about his name. And yet his name never was as high again after this as it was before this. I think we need to impress upon our young people that they, whenever they decide to go into sin, whether it be a life of drinking, whether it be a life of drugs, whether it be a life of illicit immoralities, that their name is going to be uh, blemished, that their reputation is going to be greatly harmed, greatly hindered. Some people who have been honest and moral and upright in earlier life and then for a period have turned against that kind of life, and then in later life turned back, still fine, I cannot gain back the good name I once had. There is still a little bit of that distrust when I go to borrow money if I have a history of embezzling. There is still a little bit of distrust in my family if I happen to be gone from home a little bit longer than I ordinarily am. Because whenever that happens, as is true with a bird whose wing or pinion has been broken, never will soar to the dizzy heights of the heaven again as once it did. That can so often happen in the life of the individual. Another lesson that we learn, and that's the place where pardon takes place. So many people have the idea, and they'll pat the place where the physical blood pump is. I just know in my heart that I am pardoned. How long have you been up here? A couple minutes. All right, let me close with this point then. Many people have the concept that pardon takes place in the mind of the sinner. Not so. It didn't take place in David's mind. It took place in the mind of the one that he sinned against, namely his heavenly father. And the heavenly father sent word to Nathan, and Nathan said to the sinner, now penitent, the Lord hath put away thy sin. I suppose there are no two other subjects taught in the Bible about which there is more confusion than the how of pardon 
and where it takes place. Most people don't have any trouble with a crime against human government. If a crime be committed in your state, pardon has to come from your governor to the person that is serving a prison term. Your governor, Mark Watt, I believe. Over in Tennessee, pardon takes place from our governor, Lamar Alexander. If it be a federal crime, it takes place in the mind of our chief executive, President Reagan. But that has to be conveyed to proper authorities, and they in turn carry the message or the pardon slip to the person in prison. Pardon takes place in the mind of God and then is conveyed by his word to the person who meets the terms of his will. Certainly there are many other lessons that could be presented, some of which are in the book that time did not allow for my bringing to you tonight, today. But all of us need to learn and ever be alert that regardless of how many years we've been faithful in the Lord's service, in a moment in which we are unguarded, we can allow sin to slip so easily upon us and maybe commit a great crime against God, even as David and Bathsheba did. Certainly the things which have been written aforetime are written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Thank you.